Hello and welcome to today's uh, episode of Automatic Negative Thoughts. This is the third in a series talking about automatic negative thoughts. My name is Penny Meckley Porter. I'm the founder of Thrive Therapy Space in Erie, PA. And I want to say thank you to the Jefferson Educational Society for hosting me today. So you may, hopefully you're tuning in because you've already been part of our other uh, talks on automatic negative thoughts. The first one was on October 23rd, and I will go ahead and post in a link to that talk. Um, that way you can go back and look at it. Let's see here, right here is a comment. Yeah, that's a link to the original talk. So uh, once again, thanks for being here and let's get started. So last week and the week before we talked about uh, all or nothing thinking. Okay, so we're talking about automatic negative thoughts, which are also known as cognitive distortions. So we all have cognitive distortions, meaning that we don't really see ourselves too accurately and we don't always see life too accurately. Um, what I mean is that we can take things personally when somebody does something and it's not really personal. It's not really about us. Or we don't really see our own strengths. We th assume that other people have strengths, but we assume that we kind of don't really have strengths. And those are really distortions because everybody has strengths. Um, as you're looking for your own cognitive distortions in your life, after you know each one of these talks, you might be kind of like looking at your life to see if you can see these cognitive distortions. Um, I'm encouraging you to use a gentle curiosity so that just kind of looking around to see what you can see. And if you do become aware of, you will become aware of cognitive distortions. Uh, use that gentle curiosity and be kind to yourself. No shaming yourself. So responding like, oh, wow, huh. I am doing that after all. Uh, the reason we really want to talk about cognitive distortions is, is because they contribute to depression, anxiety, overwhelm, anger, low self-esteem. So in the past, we talked about all or nothing thinking and overgeneralization. This time, again, we're talking about discounting the positives, meaning that, meaning that we don't recognize what we do that's good. So perhaps I don't recognize my strengths or I don't recognize my contributions to, I don't know, things that are happening at work or things that are happening in my family. So generally people tend to, when they're struggling with this, overlooking the positives, they tend to um, kind of like discount, well, obviously that's what it's called, discounting the positives. People can have a tendency to discount their contributions and say, oh, that was a fluke, uh, it was luck, that thing, it worked out pretty well, but it wasn't really because I did any, I made any contribution to it. And so we just kind of can tend to overlook um, rather than attributing our successes to any kind of skill or good choices or determination. Another issue that happens is if we do something good, it might feel like it wasn't good enough. So like, yeah, I put on that event and it, it went pretty smoothly, but this piece didn't go smoothly or I can improve on this. And so maybe, yeah, maybe there was a piece that didn't go smoothly and maybe there was a piece that you can improve on. But what we tend to do is we look at the negative, like with the, I don't know, picture like a big magnifying glass. So here's the things that I'm not necessarily doing too well in my life. Look at it with a big magnifying glass. And then around that are things that maybe I'm kind of solid at or maybe even good at, but no. I might not spend any time looking at the other things that I'm solid or good at. I tend to over-focus on the things, on the mistakes I made or the things that I feel are kind of negative. It's a natural thing to do, but it's definitely worth healing. So um, let's just talk a little bit about strengths. Like what are strengths? So strengths can be 
big things. So I don't know, I'm a therapist, so maybe I'm good with people. I hope I'm good with people. Um, and so at this point in my life, I have acknowledged that as a strength. It doesn't mean I'm always good with people. It doesn't mean I'm good with 100% of people. It just means that overall, I'm able to kind of like talk with people, I don't know, relatively easily, right? And so in order to be a strength, it doesn't mean I have to be perfect at, at something. It just means I'm kind of solid at something, right? I'm a little bit creative. If I compare myself to like real true artists, then I wouldn't even be able to use the word creative in the same sentence with myself. However, there are some ways that I can be creative. Um, as long as I said, like I said, I don't compare myself to, you know, really good, really great artists. So we can have this way of kind of discounting our own strengths. It can be hard to see our own strengths because we focus on the negative, right? And so if I wanted to call myself athletic, it would be hard to call myself athletic. Uh, it would be very difficult to call myself coordinated. So I've never been, you know, someone who come to, uh, is sporty, right? Who picks up sports easily. No, I never have. I happen to be somewhat, um, let's see, I have some endurance, um, but I'm not athletic. And if you take me outside right now and try to get me to do something, it'll take me a long time to learn it. But so why look at our strengths? We want to look at our strengths and be strength focused so that we don't allow ourselves to continually discount the positives and what we do contribute in life. Okay, so I'll tell you two examples because many of you know perhaps that I'm a therapist uh, and I have a private practice and I'm a strength based therapist. I try to help people look at their strengths and oftentimes people resist that for various reasons. So I had a, a woman at one point, this was a long time ago, She's a, she was a surgeon and worked, um, I think in New York State somewhere. So she's a surgeon and I, when I asked her about her strengths, she kind of like didn't even know what I meant. And when I talked about strengths, she was aware that she didn't even want to go there with me, like talk about her strengths. She thought I was inviting her to make herself feel superior to other people. And I was not inviting her to feel superior to other people. She explained that she'd been bullied as a kid and um, that the bullies seemed to feel superior to other people. And she didn't want to have no part of that. Plus, she had a deep and abiding belief that we're all equal, that nobody's better than anybody else. So she thought I was inviting her to be superior, but I wasn't. So after a while, after a couple sessions, she was able to start to identify her strengths. And she had some strengths as a surgeon that she was um, good at explaining things. Uh, she was good at mentoring younger you know, interns. She was good at like looking at new equipment and comparing new equipment to other equipment that she'd used in the past and even talking about that publicly or writing up um, you know, journal articles on comparing I don't know what kind of equipment you use, but this equipment with this equipment, right? And so over time, she started to realize that those were her strengths and it was valuable to her because then she started to make some decisions about how she spent her professional time based on that. So she started to write more journal articles. She started to want to be the one who mentored the younger um, interns and that kind of thing, right? So that's an example. It impacted her life when she was able to recognize her strengths because then her strengths were also areas that she kind of wanted to spend more time in. They were areas where she felt um, excited. So one other example, um, I have had a client a while back and I asked him to look at his strengths and he felt super awkward about it. Oftentimes people feel awkward about looking at their strengths. So he did, and I asked him to talk to some of his friends about his strengths, um, which can feel awkward also. Um, but the idea is not to make you feel awkward. The idea is to really start to let it sink in that you do have strengths. So he talked to some of his friends and, you know, kind of reported back at another session about the things that his friends had said. And he was able to acknowledge that those things were true, 
that he was the person that was really good at getting the group together. He was really good at keeping the group uh, connected with each other. He was um, a positive in, in, impact in the group. Um, so there were a number of strengths and he came back and acknowledged these. He acknowledged some strengths kind of professionally. But then he talked about how those strengths just weren't important. So, okay, so like I have these strengths, but they don't really matter. Like my friends have these strengths that are really more important. And other people I work with professionally, they have strengths and their strengths are more impactful and more important. See what I'm saying? So even once he was able to identify his strengths, he discounted the value of his strengths and and obviously valued strengths that he saw in other people. Okay. How do we stop discounting the positives? Well, it's a practice. So this is one in a series of mindfulness discussions we've had here at the Jefferson. And all of this mindfulness, it all comes down to practicing. So we can have habits and it's like being a good basketball player. Like even I could learn how to, you know, I don't know, shoot baskets. I would probably never be super good, but um, I could certainly get better. So practicing helps. So how do we get better? We practice. We must be aware of habit because we can have a habit of discounting our strengths and discounting the positive contributions we make. It can also feel safer to discount our strengths. We might feel kind of vulnerable if we start to acknowledge that we're good at something. It might not really feel comfortable. And we can have these beliefs, like for example, I'll never really amount to anything. That can be an underlying belief, kind of a hidden belief or a known belief. Another belief could be uh, people who believe in themselves are stuck up or our bullies. So we can have these underlying beliefs that aren't true in the world, but we can believe them anyway. So it can feel kind of unsafe to start to step out of these things that we've believed for many years. So I'd like you to think now about something that might be a strength of yours. It could be something that people have told you about yourself, uh, that you're kind, that you're good at presentations, that you can, maybe that you teach well, that you're athletic, that you're witty, that you're, I don't know, good at math, good at reading. So think about something that you might have a strength in or even think about a situation where you might have made a contribution and consider what strengths do you have that helped you in that situation? Consider, do I have strengths? Did I make a positive contribution? and notice your own resistance, perhaps, to labeling something as a strength. And think about a friend, if a friend had done a similar thing to what you had done, would you consider that a strength or a positive contribution in your friend? And then does it feel okay to consider that a strength in yourself? Does it feel okay to acknowledge perhaps that you did a good job on something? And if it does feel okay, good, I'm glad. And if it doesn't feel okay, then that's what you want to keep looking at because we want it to feel okay or we want to push ourselves into that area where we accept that we do have strengths 
that we do make contributions in various areas of our life. So let's go ahead and do a mindfulness practice as we always do. I'd like you to sit comfortably, kind of alert, but relaxed. Oops. Sitting comfortably, alert, yet relaxed. Feet flat on the floor. And close your eyes if that's comfortable. And bring your awareness to your breath. So that could be kind of in your chest cavity where you're noticing the expansion and the contraction of your body with each breath. Or bring your awareness right there to the edge of your nose. And notice the sound of the breath with the inhale and exhale, or the feel of the breath with it each inhale and exhale. So noticing your breathing, anchoring your awareness on your breath. Then I'd like you to observe in your mind your surroundings. So observing the sounds in the room where you are. Maybe there's a vent or some kind of noise. Obviously you can hear me talking. So observing the sounds observing sensations in your body, sensations of your clothing, sensations of yourself seated on your chair, your feet on the floor. Bringing your awareness to where you are within the room that you're in. You're kind of observing yourself in your surroundings. Good. Now let's take a moment for you to be like observing your thoughts. Perhaps you've been immersed in the present moment and haven't been thinking too much. Perhaps you've noticed what we call monkey mind. That is that your brain can kind of bounce around to other things and think about the bananas that you forgot to put on the list or any kind of thing. Many of us have monkey mind. Many, all of us have monkey mind. So kind of observing what your thoughts have been today. Whether your mind has stayed present and anchored in this meditation and in your body when I was suggesting that. Or if your thoughts were kind of wandering off in different directions or darting off even. So we're moving your awareness between different things. At first we had your awareness anchored on your breath. Then we had your awareness move to the room that you're in, including sounds and sensations in your body. Now we've brought your awareness to your thoughts. Next, I'd like to bring your awareness to your body and the places where you normally feel your emotions. So I'd like you to notice, ask yourself now, how am I feeling? 
and listen to your body's response. Tuning into that place or places. Listening to your body's response or your brain's response. And seeing if you can match a word or words to the emotions that you feel. It could be anxious, sad, frustrated, judgmental, peaceful, calm, torn, or any other emotion or emotions. It's likely you're having more than just one emotion right now. Next, I would like you to bring your awareness back to your breath. Anchoring your awareness in your breath now, either in your body, perhaps your torso where you are aware of the expansion and contraction of your body with each breath. or you're bringing your awareness to the sound or sensation of your breath right there at your nose. And take one deep breath in, deeper than usual. With your next in-breath, breathe in and make it deeper than usual. And then with your exhalation, make it deeper also than usual as if you're blowing out some candles. And then come right back to your normal breath. And then when you open your then when you're ready, I'd like you to open your eyes and return to I guess to me. So for homework Practicing this, coming back to this, or any, any other mindfulness exercise. So one way to practice would be to set some time aside every day, five minutes, and practice this. Sitting comfortably, closing your eyes, noticing your breath, observing yourself in the room, observing your thoughts, observing your emotions, and then coming back to your breath. If that feels too complicated, toss out any of those you want to toss out. And just have a practice of sitting calmly and focusing on any of those that are really drawing your attention. But another thing I'd like you to do is start a list of your strengths. Again, strengths can be big or small. And strengths can also be things you enjoy, like that you enjoy nature. I enjoy nature. I love to read. I always loved math. So strengths can be things that you enjoy or you love, things that you've worked hard at, things that have come naturally to you. And if you're willing, ask some of your friends or colleagues or family members, what are some of your strengths? And it might feel awkward, that's not the point. The point is to listen to the feedback they give you. So thank you for being here this week. And next week we will be talking about emotional reasoning. And what I mean is using our emotions, when our emotions get big, 
to make decisions or using our emotions when they get big to be assessing ourselves and the world around us rather than grounding ourselves and feeling more centered when we evaluate ourselves and the world around us. It's called emotional reasoning. Thanks again for being a part of this and I look forward to seeing you next week at the Jefferson Educational Society live Facebook feed at noon. Thanks again.